exercise for special populations. All right, let's first look at diabetes in individuals who have diabetes. All right, it's characterized by hyperglycemia, so an increase in uh, the, uh, glyce glycol or glycogen, excuse me, in the bloodstream, so high blood sugar. It can be one of two ways, and, there, and this is where we get into the different types, type 1 and type 2. So there's a, in type 1, there's a defect in the insulin secretion. And individuals who have this disorder are going to be insulin dependent. They're going to have some type of external means of getting insulin into their body, usually through an injection. Uh, it will usually develop early on in life, so more younger individuals are going to have type 1 diabetes and are going to be diagnosed with type 1 diabetes than so older individuals. Now type 2, there's a defect in the insulin action, so, there, so these people are insulin resistant. And usually it has to do with the receptors within the uh, within the cells. They're not able to um, utilize the insulin as good as normal. And it is associated with obesity and a sedentary lifestyle. So those are risk factors for developing type 2 diabetes. And diet and exercise is really the best treatment for treating type 2 diabetes. Now type 2 it used to be called adult onset diabetes and it, and it still is referred to as adult onset diabetes but that nomenclature has kind of changed a little bit just because due to our lifestyle over the past 30 40 years a lot of children have become uh, type 2 diabetic because they're a little more overweight and obese and they have a sedentary lifestyle All right, so just because it, so just uh, because of our lifestyles now have changed so much that younger individuals are starting to get a disease that was once classified as just uh, adults are going to get it. Now for the prevalence, uh, older individuals tend to have more cases of diabetes than young, even though we do see some younger individuals um, uh, getting type 2 diabetes. And there's also some race disparities. Uh, Native Americans, African Americans, Hispanics, uh, and also Asian um, populations tend to have a little bit higher uh, incidence of diabetes. Now just a couple of quick notes I want to make about this. This is a table from the book uh, looking at the names. So type 1 was juvenile onset and most of the time younger individuals uh, early on uh, in their life are going to be diagnosed with type 1 diabetes so they're going to be insulin dependent for the most part the, the rest of their lives and they're going to have to um, make sure that they have some uh, exogenous insulin around just in case that their blood sugar gets uh, too high. And then the type 2 again is known as adult onset but we kind of have to be wary of that now. And you can see most of the diabetes is going to be the type 2 kind. Now this ketoacidosis is an important point as well. Uh, ketosis basically is going to be um, using more fats and breaking those down and using ketones for fuel. And because the brain needs glucose to function, it can't run off of fat or protein, but the brain can also run off of ketones, which is you know breaking down of fatty acids or they're created by breaking down fatty acids so the brain can use it in a time where it can't get glucose. Uh, 
uh, one of the side effects of using ketones is it actually produces acetone which causes bad breath it almost smells like nail polish remover so anyone who is diabetic uh, sometimes have has instances where their breath starts to stink a little bit uh, also if people are on low carb diets uh, they tend to use more ketones than glucose because they're not putting in a lot of glucose or carbohydrates into their body so the body is relying a lot on ketones so the acetones are produced and their breath starts to stink a little bit so just a couple points there So exercise and the diabetic. So the main focus here is to try to control the blood glucose. All right, uh, before, during, and after the exercise. It needs to be as close to normal uh, prior to exercise especially. Uh, because ex during exercise, we're gonna use a lot of that blood glucose. So we're gonna be, or we're gonna be needing that, that energy from the blood glucose. So it needs to be uh, controlled beforehand. So adequate insulin is required, all right, especially in type 1 diabetics. But again, uh, ketosis could occur uh, if it isn't controlled uh, properly and we get an accumulation of ketone bodies and this is caused by excess fat metabolism like I explained earlier. Now here's a figure from the uh, book pretty much explaining what happens if you don't control uh, blood, blood glucose beforehand, before the exercise. And as you can see, the diabetics that had it controlled, the ketone bodies remain relatively low all throughout the exercise. But ones that uh, started off a little bit high that weren't really in control of their uh, insulin or blood glucose levels showed an increase in ketones throughout exercise. And the same thing down here, referring to blood glucose, the blood, glu blood glucose actually remained relatively um, low uh, and in fact didn't increase uh, all that much, decreased a little bit actually. Um, throughout exercise as compared to someone who was not in control of their blood glucose before exercise they remained relatively high and especially the ketone bodies All right, so exercise for type one diabetics. So exercise is part of the treatment. The other part of that is a diet. All right, just because someone has a uh, disorder um, doesn't mean that they can't exercise or have a good diet. Again, everything pretty much all the time goes back to exercising, uh, being physically active and having a uh, well-regulated diet, all right, a healthy diet. All right, now there's certain, you know, special precautions that you need to take if you have some type of disorder like type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes, all right, but generally speaking, exercise and a good diet, all right, and the goal of that diet then is to try to regulate the blood glucose and ingesting the right amount of carbohydrates. 
to maintain a uh, relatively good blood glucose level so you don't become hyperglycemic or hypoglycemic. Exercise alone doesn't <clears throat> excuse me doesn't improve the blood glucose control um, but there is improvement of cardio coronary heart disease risk factors though so decreasing the uh, total peripheral resistance uh, increasing your high density lipoprotein or your good cholesterol decreasing the bad cholesterol All right, one thing to be aware of is they don't want to go into hypoglycemic shock or insulin shock. All right, so maintaining a good insulin level throughout exercise before, during, and also after exercise as well. And also the pertaining to the exercise schedule itself, all right, you need to monitor the intensity, the frequency, and the duration and try to maintain relatively constant um, intensity, frequency, and duration. And the purpose of this is to get an idea of how your body responds to a certain amount of exercise and certain uh, time uh, duration of exercise and keep that constant. That way that individual uh, knows uh, what they need to eat or how much insulin they need to take uh, during certain uh, points of uh, of the day or during exercise. All right, so you can modify the diet, modify the diet, and or exercise, um, and the insulin to try to maintain the blood glucose levels. So there's some fine tuning that needs to be adjusted, uh, and and it's going to be relatively constant fine tuning. Uh, but if you get on a good schedule and have that exercise be relatively the same all the time. Uh, that individual can judge uh, what they need to have. All right, and this figure over here is simply explaining if someone starts uh, too high all right, for their blood glucose, there's going to be a huge uptake by the muscles, which is, I mean, the, the, the muscles love the blood glucose. That's uh, relatively quick energy for it. So they bring in a lot of the blood glucose. However, that actually decreases the amount of glucose within the blood so they become hypoglycemic. All right, so you want to maintain a relatively constant uh, blood glucose level before, during, and uh, after the exercise to try to prevent hypoglycemia or insulin shock. All right, for type 1 diabetics, um, you do need to, or at least a lot of times, you need to make sure that they're up for the challenge of the exercise and up to the stress of the exercise. So ECG or EKG, uh, or monitoring of the heart, or a stress test before exercise. Uh, for individuals who are over 35 years of age, or over 25 years of age and have uh, type 1 or type 2 diabetes for at least 10 years. All right, because there could be some underlying factors there that are risk factors for coronary heart disease, such as smoking, hypertension, peripheral artery disease, uh, which, which then could uh, possibly lead to uh, renal disease or failure. So you need to uh, possibly do a stress test to try to uh, figure out if their body is up for the activity. Or not and see if there's any other underlying conditions that need to be taken into account uh, but also maybe even treat those as well 
Now the control for pre-exercise. Right, greater than 250 milligrams per deciliter with ketosis and greater than 300 milligrams per deciliter with, with uh, ketosis. And less than 100 milligrams per deciliter uh, equals uh, you need to ingest some type of carbohydrates beforehand. All right, so these numbers here, 250 and 300, those are high. All right, so you're going to need to be ingesting uh, or get some type of exogenous insulin in to try to decrease those amounts. All right, monitoring the blood glucose before and after exercise is the key here. Uh, and also during exercise, you, you can uh, possibly monitor it if there's a break in the activity. All right, insulin administration or carbohydrate ingestion when needed. And there's also going back to the principle of individual individuality. Uh, each person needs to know uh, how blood glucose is going to be affected by exercise or ingesting a certain amount of carbohydrates right maybe they have a, a candy bar on hand uh, you know how much is their blood glucose going to be affected just by eating that one candy bar uh, you know at certain points during the exercise also some additional considerations to take into account is neuropathy all right and the heart rate and blood pressure can be affected uh, because the neuropathy would be if there's some type of peripheral nerve damage uh, due to the the diabetes all right one of the conditions that diabetes could possibly cause uh, the neuropathy can cause some pain uh, some balance problems also cause weakness uh, within the legs uh, and decreased uh, proprioception, meaning that their their muscles and their nerves aren't able to respond as well to uh, certain degrees of uh, stress or strain on the muscles or the ligaments. All right, drinking fluids and having carbohydrates on hand, especially having carbohydrates on hand, is, is a key thing. And fluids, uh, you know, everyone needs some type of fluids throughout exercise. Uh, where you're at risk for dehydration. Also, one of the recommendations is don't exercise alone, especially if uh, they do tend to become hypoglycemic. They can go into insulin shock then, and it's good to have someone on hand to help them out uh, and to get help uh, or call paramedics if they need to, uh, and also possibly carry ID with you as well. All right, some exercise regimens that uh, are recommended for people with type 1 diabetes. So again, there's aerobic and resistance training that uh, should be uh, taking place. So with three to seven days per week for aerobic training, uh, 50 to 80 percent of the um, uh, heart rate reserve, and 20 to 60 minutes per session as well. So 150 minutes per week uh, for moderate exercise and about 75 minutes every week for vigorous activity. All right, and these should be low impact activities, especially if the individual is a little bit older. Um, they could have some neuropathy uh, problems, but if they're relatively overall healthy, other than the type 1 diabetes, I mean, you can do some uh, maybe heavier impact activities, but for the most part, you want to try to uh, limit the amount of impact on the um, on the joints and then resistance training again no different uh, for the most part other than uh, no valsalva maneuver all right so basically the same for uh, 
uh, everyone else uh, two to three days per week uh, 60 to 80 percent of their one rep maximum uh, two to three sets eight to twelve reps all right All right, so looking at type 2 diabetes, exercise is a primary treatment, all right? And really, you're trying to treat the obesity because most, most individuals that have type 2 diabetes are either overweight or obese. So if you treat the obesity, and a lot of studies have shown this, that it, it does reduce, and reduce the uh, type 2 diabetes, but also a lot of times it cures it. So it helps control the blood glucose and it, it reduces the risk of insulin resistance all right, by dropping a lot of that weight, a lot, a lot of uh, body fat. All right, I need to be kind of clear on that. Someone who is really muscular that weighs 220 pounds is probably not going to have type 2 diabetes, but it's the um, obesity in terms of percent body fat that is the problem. Uh, this also helps treat cardiovascular disease risk factors as well. It decreases the blood pressure, uh, increases good cholesterol, decreases the bad cholesterol. Now some individuals that are type 2 diabetic can have some type of exogenous insulin that they inject, uh, also other drugs that they take, uh, but exercise and diet, a really good diet, uh, and dropping that weight can eliminate the need for any drug replacement or drug treatments. And for the medication, uh, need to adjust the dosage to maintain blood glucose during exercise. Some of these medications affect <clears throat> either insulin or blood glucose. So again, it's one of those situations where you want to try to keep the exercise relatively uh, the same. Uh, you know, obviously you want to try to lose the weight, but trying to keep it the same to see how your body reacts to it and see what type of modifications you need to make to the, uh, to the drug dosage uh, and also the exercise and possibly the diet. So again, you want to try to avoid hypoglycemia, all right, low blood sugar. All right, so the exercise prescription for type 2 diabetics. All right, moderate intensity activity, approximately 150 minutes per week. So start off in short bouts, uh, especially if they have possibly some type of neuropathy. Uh, neuropathy um, or type 1 diabetics tend to be out of shape, overweight, or obese. Uh, their physical activity levels are, are really low. Uh, so starting off... You know, really short bouts of exercise uh, at moderate intensity uh, can help them uh, get through some of those early pains of exercise, all right? Delayed onset muscle soreness being one of them. Um, if you start them off too quick, obviously there's underlying conditions, heart disease and, and um, conditions like that, that uh, could be a problem. Um, but they're just they're just out of shape, and if they can't do the high intensity exercise or higher intensity exercise, and if you push them too much, they could drop out, and then um, then they're going to go back to uh, low physical activity or no physical activity. So about four to seven times per week, and need to promote a sustained increase in insulin sensitivity. All right, and by doing this. Um, you can have uh, weight loss, which obviously is beneficial to um, having an increase in insulin uh, sensitivity, and also developing a habit. 
habit of exercise. Uh, when they start exercising, especially if they haven't been physically active, they can start to get a little bit of euphoria feel and start to feel, hey, this is this is working. This is uh, beneficial for me. I feel better after exercise than I do after sitting on the couch for four or five hours a day and uh, eating a bunch of junk food. All right, so making a habit of it, getting them into, into the mindset of the exercise is good for me. The considerations, the additional considerations for type one di or type two diabetics is the same as for type one diabetics. All right, drink fluids, have carbohydrates on hand just in case they do go a little bit hypoglycemic and don't exercise alone and possibly carry identification as well. All right, let's switch gears and go to asthma. So asthma is a respiratory problem or condition. Uh, there's some type of inflammation that's occurring uh, and there's shortness of breath accompanied by wheezing. All right, that inflammation uh, essentially causes an obstruction and you can't get a lot of air within the lungs then. So the diagnosis and causes. So to diagnose it, um, you do a pulmonary function test. And it's caused, it's usually triggered by some type of dust, chemicals, antibodies, uh, or possibly exercise. And we'll look at exercise here in a second. Uh, but a lot of times uh, impurities in the air will actually trigger the response. And what's going to happen is going to be a calcium influx into the mast cells within the bronchioles. All right, and this causes uh, med uh, chemical mediators to be released. And there's going to be bronchoconstriction. So the smooth muscle within the bronchioles in the airways contracts. All right, causing um, a narrowing of the tubes. There's also going to be a reflex to constrict the bronchioles via the vagus nerve. We've seen the vagus nerve back when we talked about the heart and regulating the heart rate. In this case, it's going to be uh, constricting the bronchioles. And then we're also going to get an uh, inflammatory response. And in fact, one of the chemical mediators is going to be histamine. And if you know anything about histamine, pretty much Anywhere, any place that histamine is, there's inflammation that's occurring. All right, so looking at the progression of asthma and what's actually occurring here. So we have some type of initiator. So it being impurities in the air, either dust, pollen, uh, some type of smoke. Um, and that's going to cause the calcium to go into the mast cell. So this uh, kind of aqua colored box right here, blue green box, is the mast cell. And here's the cell membrane within the bronchioles. So there's an increase in calcium influx into the mast cell. So therefore it causes the chemical mediators to be released. One of them being histamine causing an inflammatory response. And we get a constriction of the smooth muscle because of that increase in calcium but also because of the vagus nerve as well. So we get this narrowing of the bronchioles and we can't get and they can't get enough air into the lungs then.
All right, so let's look at exercise-induced asthma. So a lot of times it's caused by breathing dry air. All right, and there's a heat loss from the respiratory system. Remember that, uh, back when we talked about the respiratory system, it is uh, there's a lot of fluid, all right, and there's a lot of a lot of water within the, uh, or not a lot, a huge amount, but there's enough to uh, uh, moisten the air as it comes in. All right, now if it's really dry, some of that heat is actually going to be lost to the uh, atmosphere uh, because of the exchange. Uh, all right, the um, when we think back to evaporation, there's going to be an exchange of heat from the uh, water on the skin to the air. So it's the same. Um, it's the same principle. All right, so there's going to be a lot of heat loss, and this will cause an influx of calcium into the mast cell, and then we get the chemical mediators and then the bronchoconstriction then. So it's the breathing of the dry air that initiates that response. But performance for the most part doesn't seem to be impaired because uh, most of the time this exercise induced asthma actually occurs after exercise, either early on, five to 15 minutes after exercise, that's known as the early phase, or a later phase which is you know hours, four to six hours after exercise. So a lot of times this doesn't occur during exercise, uh, like it would someone who has um, you know, full-blown asthma, but uh, so it doesn't really impair the exercise because it's not occurring during the activity, most of the time. Now it can be diagnosed uh, by an exercise challenge running uh, at about 85 to 90 percent of heart rate max, so very high intensity exercise, and then seeing uh, different pulmonary uh, variables after exercise or during exercise as well. Also, if there's a at least a 10 percent decrease in forced expiratory volume uh, one or FEV one, that's um, your forced expiratory volume breathing outward. Um, forcefully for one second. So how much air you can exhale in one second. So if there's at least a 10% decrease, uh, a lot of times uh, that's inducive of exercise-induced asthma. So reducing the risk for um, developing EIA, uh, a warm-up. In fact, uh, a lot of uh, studies and case studies have shown that um, if if an exercise is performed during the normal exercise or if there's two activities performed back to back there's a less of a chance of developing exercise induced asthma after that activity and short duration exercises as well uh, also wearing a face mask in cold weather uh, and this is because as you breathe outward into the face mask, it warms the face mask. And it also, there's going to be some water loss in the material. So then as you inhale, you're essentially humidifying the air as it comes in. So that's a, another way to, uh, to try to um, not breathe in as much dry air then. So looking at some of the treatments for EIA, beta-2 agonists, uh, if the uh, asthma is occurring during exercise, uh, and this will reduce the chemical mediators that are released, uh, also help reduce the calcium influx. So we actually get a bronchodilation, uh, or at least not as much bronchoconstriction. Now, if it's occurring during exercise, a, a lot of times it's there's going to be an underlying factor there 
and most of the time it's going to be that someone actually has uh, regular asthma uh, so that needs to be uh, taken into account as well um, having inhalers on hand also having a lower salt intake all right this is uh, linked to reduced calcium within the smooth muscle also antioxidant supplements uh, some of the vitamins so vitamin supplements it could desensitize the cell to the chemical mediators thus not causing um, the uh, the bronchoconstriction then and another recommendation uh, and some evidence to show that fish oil supplements uh, where we get the omega fatty acids the omega-3 omega-6 fatty acids this also uh, helps to reduce inflammation Right, let's look at hypertension. So the classifications for being hypertensive all right, or high blood pressure. So normal blood pressure is going to be uh, systolic blood pressure of less than 120 and diastolic of less than 80. Pre-hypertension, you have a systolic of between 120 and 139 or a diastolic of 80 to 89. All right, so remember that or. So if you have a systolic blood pressure of um, 120 over 75, you're still prehypertensive because you still have a systolic between uh, 120 to 139, even though your diastolic is lower than uh, prehypertensive classification. Now being hypertensive then, uh, your systolic is greater than or equal to 140 and your diastolic then is greater than or equal to 90 All right, and there's an or there as well uh, treatments uh, if the individual is smoking have them stop smoking uh, there's also medications that can be used to try to decrease blood pressure Diet and exercise, the non the non pharmacological um, treatments. Again, it always goes back to diet and exercise. All right, weight loss. Um, all right, not everyone uh, who is hypertensive is overweight or obese, um, but a lot of times individuals who are overweight and obese have hypertension. So decreasing some of the fat mass. Uh, can greatly improve their blood pressure. Also eating fruits and veggies, reducing saturated fat and overall fat and cholesterol as well, and reduced sodium and caloric intake. And reducing the sodium uh, is important because when we uh, look back to um, the uh, I guess the the blood we've seen that wherever sodium goes water goes so if we ingest a lot of sodium there's going to be a lot of water within our blood as well which causes a greater volume and a greater pressure throughout the entire vascular tree so if we decrease our sodium we decrease the sodium within our blood therefore decrease our, our water as well So recommendations for exercise in terms of someone being hypertensive moderate intensity 40 to 60 percent uh, 30 minutes per day uh, most days of the week uh, you know four to six days per week and approximately 700 to 2,000 kilocalories per week now this is a recommendation that, that the book outlined 
Uh, now that that will vary depending on the individual. Uh, the ACSM guidelines for improving VO2 max uh, is actually good recommendations for controlling blood pressure and decreasing hypertension. Also, the blood pressure should be checked uh, if they're being medic uh, medicated uh, and altering the dosage as well because once they start exercising and maybe eating a little bit better and their, um, their blood pressure starts to drop, they need to see their doctor and um, figure out an adjusted dosage then um, in a response to that decrease in blood pressure. Cardiac rehab. All right, the patient population for cardiac rehab uh, is going to be individuals who have a few different um, conditions: uh, angina pectoris or chest pain due to ischemia, they're going to be using beta blockers for treatment to try to reduce the heart rate and the blood pressure. Uh, and exercise in this case actually aids in the beta blockers because it can reduce the uh, the heart rate uh, response. All right, so they don't get as high a, of, of a heart rate during a certain uh, intensity of activity. Someone in uh, cardiac rehab could also have had a myocardial infarction or a heart attack. And a training effect is similar to non-myocardial infarction patients. And that they can increase their VO2 max, they can um, decrease their blood pressure, all right? They can uh, decrease the risk factors for uh, possibly having another heart attack as well. Also, people who have had bypass surgery. Uh, exercise is gonna be beneficial um, so that uh, they can have the ability to perform exercise uh, at a higher intensity uh, and continue on with their exercise. All right, before the bypass surgery, they might not have been able to exercise uh, maybe at all or not at a um, relatively moderate intensity even. And also individuals could possibly have uh, angioplasty, which is simply uh, inserting a catheter into a blood vessel to open it up because it was blocked um, for some reason. Now the exercise programs for someone in cardiac rehab Give me three phases. Phase one is inpatient exercise program. This is going to be done uh, in the uh, healthcare setting. All right, and this is the transition from having that heart attack or MI to discharge. Um, most of the time, uh, these individuals, I mean, are going to be tired just you know walking, you know, 20 or 30 feet. All right, um, there was a in the in-class portion of, or the in-person portion of this class, there was an individual who worked in cardiac rehab, uh, and she explained that some of the individuals, um, and the doctors recommend that day after the exercise, or after after the uh, the surgery, and after um, uh, treating the heart attack, they actually got up and had them get up and do some type of activity and even just walking from the bed to the door was really tiring for them. So they're not going to be able to do a lot of exercise but it is beneficial for them to get up and start moving around even right after um, the uh, the attack. Now phase two, this is going to be outpatient 
uh, but it is supervised in the, in the healthcare setting, so they do need to come back and do the exercise. Uh, it'll be a light exercise intensity, all right? All right, you're gonna get the target heart rate from a graded exercise test. Uh, you shouldn't use 220 uh, minus the age, all right, because they're gonna have a low, a really low VO2 max, I mean, below 20 uh, ml per kg per minute. Uh, so using uh, heart rate max to, to determine a um, uh, exercise intensity is not the best approach here. All right, an intermittent exercise, all right, nothing long duration, just, you know, maybe short, quick bursts of activity. And some low intensity exercise uh, resistance training as well. All right, high reps, uh, large muscle groups, trying to get the whole body involved in this as well, almost making it uh, somewhat of an, an aerobic activity, but not really full-blown aerobic, but having some type of resistance associated with it. Then phase three is going to be less supervised. This can be performed at home by the individual. All right, so the effects of the cardiac rehab, you have improved cardiovascular function, and obviously that's the most important thing here, is improving uh, the heart and the, the cardiovascular system, and trying to get it back to somewhat normal. So there is an improved cardiovascular function then. So you have a higher, uh, they do tend to uh, increase their VO2 max. Uh, they can have higher intensity without that ischemia and their endurance also increases that you know that walking from their bed to the door increases from you know being able to walk outside you know for you know a half hour or uh, maybe do some housework all right so uh, and that's a lot of times the, the important thing is to be able to do daily activities uh, get them to that point where they can do those activities uh, without becoming too tired or uh, having chest pain or anything like that also, the risk factors for possibly developing another condition, um, uh, a heart attack or um, uh, narrowing of the arteries, uh, they lower their total cholesterol, uh, increase their HDL, which is the good, good cholesterol, all right? and this is uh, done a lot of times by even just modifying the diet. And overall reduction of uh, risk for cardiovascular event then. Uh, exercise for the older adults. VO2 max is going to decrease approximately 1% each year after 25 years of age. All right. And a lot of times this has to do with lower physical activity. When we get older, we tend to gain a little bit more weight, and it's not usually good weight, not like fat free mass or muscle, but it's fat mass. All right. Uh, our, our metabolism decreases, but then our physical activity also decreases, so we gain a lot more fat then. Um, and we lose some of the fat-free mass because our activity levels are not maintained. So this causes just regular daily activities, um, you know, housework, gardening, uh, you know, playing with the kids or the grandkids. It starts to become a little bit more strenuous. Uh, the aerobic capacity then declines about 10% per decade um, in endurance uh, trained athletes or athletes or just endurance trained individuals. They don't necessarily have to be an athlete. Could also be a baseline effect. So, you know, it's going to be affected from where they started as well. Uh, and then also any type of weight gain is going to affect the aerobic capacity also. 
Now, some of the benefits, obviously improving the risk factors, same with uh, younger individuals, increased strength in VO2 max, also the prevention and treatment of osteoporosis or decrease in uh, bone density. All right, osteoporosis. So like I said, it's reduced bone density. And there's gonna be an increase in the risk of fractures. If you decrease the uh, structure of the bones, uh, it's gonna cause uh, a weakening of the entire structure itself. So it's gonna be able to break more easily. It is more common in women. Uh, and in fact, uh, in women uh, over 50 years of age, it's mostly due to menopause. You have a decrease in the estrogen, which causes a decrease in uh, bone resorption and, and building of, or building or maintaining of bone de bone density. And the treatment for it, uh, supplements is is a key one. Uh, increasing calcium intake. Vitamin D, All right, but also eating foods that are rich in calcium, such as milk um, and uh, meat products as well. Vitamin D, uh, get that also from milk, but also uh, sunlight helps uh, helps us make vitamin D within the body. So it's important to get a little bit of sun every once in a while. Also, hormone replacement therapy for the estrogen. However, the hormone replacement therapy could actually increase the risk for cardiovascular disease. So the risk for that treatment could actually be greater than not even getting the treatment at all. So it could just uh, be more beneficial to ingest more calcium and vitamin D and then also exercise as well. So this is a case where uh, some type of uh, maybe drug treatment isn't necessarily the best thing all right, and can lead to something maybe even a little bit worse as well. Exercise for bone health. So the mode of exercise needs to be weight-bearing. Endurance exercise uh, involves some type of jumping or and also uh, resistance training, resistance exercise as well. Our bones are like our muscles. We put stress on them and they're going to respond by building more material, right, becoming stronger. All right, the bones are exactly, not exactly uh, physiologically speaking, but in terms of their mechanism of uh, staying strong and maybe becoming stronger is the same. Uh, the intensity, moderate to high, again, this is going to uh, be affected by, you know, what activity level are they at now, what endurance level, what's their aerobic capacity now. Uh, the frequency, the weight-bearing exercises approximately three to five times per week uh, and resistance training about two to three times per week and again this can vary as well and the duration um, even just uh, you know a, a low amount of uh, 30 minutes per day All right 30 to 60 minutes per day Right. Older and older endurance trained individuals obviously tend to have a higher VO2 max. Uh, they have a higher high density lipoprotein, the good cholesterol, a lower bad cholesterol, and overall triglycerides. Right? And they have an enhanced glucose intolerance and insulin sensitivity as well. 
They have greater strength, quicker reaction time. They have a reduced risk for falls. Their coordination is a lot better. So, you know, it, it was once thought that, you know, older individuals, uh, they, they don't need to exercise as much. They don't need to partake in maybe resistance training. Uh, you know, that's for younger individuals who are playing football or uh, some type of sport like that. But if physical activity, whether it be aerobic or resistance training, is beneficial throughout the entire lifespan. We'll see here in a second that even younger individuals can partake in weight training and it's still beneficial. And some of the benefits of endurance training, uh, you have increases in VO2 max. You have improved risk factors for coronary heart disease, which is important for older individuals because they're more likely to develop some type of cardiovascular condition. And then obviously the bone density then is increased or at least maintained. exercise during pregnancy so some considerations to uh, to think about would be there's going to be an increased demand for nutrients because not only is that woman uh, eating for herself but she's also feeding the baby as well so the uh, the baby is going to be uh, needing a lot of the nutrients from the mother uh, uh, a woman who is pregnant uh, should go get a medical examination prior to partaking in some type of exercise regimen uh, just to make sure that there's no uh, underlying condition, uh, nothing else that's going on, making sure that uh, her and the baby uh, can um, are, are going to be okay during the exercise. Uh, and usually it's recommended that it's not very high intensity activity. Also, some of the adaptations to pregnancy, there's going to be an increased blood volume, 40 to 50 percent, right? Increase in plasma volume, uh, and this is seen some in uh, in in women who are pregnant. Uh, you know, they maybe get some swelling around their hands, their feet as well. VO2 and heart rate at rest are increased. All right, there's an increased demand uh, being placed on the body. Obviously, there's a, you know there's another human being growing inside of them. So there's going to be an increased demand for all the nutrients, the blood, fluids, everything. Uh, and also the added weight, especially later on, uh, you know, in the third trimester, uh, there's going to be that added weight um, that causes an increase in VO2 and heart rate also. And cardiac output is also higher at rest, at least during the first and second trimesters. So the exercise, um, even early on, starts to become more strenuous uh, at certain exercise intensities. So uh, the woman needs to be aware of that. All right, some of the associated risks with exercise during pregnancy. Um, the regular endurance exercise doesn't seem to have too much um, of a risk on the baby itself. Uh, and in fact, there's really hardly any. Uh, I mean, as long as they're not going um, full force, you know, exercise intensity, you know, VO2 max or anything, or any type of contact act activity, but that's another issue. Uh, it is still beneficial for the mother. It reduces the risk of gestational diabetes, all right, which is fairly common. All right, it doesn't happen all the time, but it, it is uh, relatively common. Also, the VO2 max is either increased or maintained. And also, training plus being pregnant actually causes a greater adaptation compared to being trained only and it, they've done a couple studies with this uh, in, in the book outlined it where that uh, women who were pregnant and were training at the same time 
then had the baby and then continued to train afterward, you know, obviously there's probably a couple of weeks rest in there, uh, they actually had a greater response and a greater VO2 max increase than individuals who just simply trained throughout that period as well. So, I mean, if you think about it, there's a lot of stress being placed on the body uh, during, uh, during pregnancy. All right, some of the recommendations, uh, 30 minutes per day, most days of the week. Uh, the intensity. Uh, heart rate uh, used to be said, you know, don't go above 140 beats per minute. Uh, that's being challenged a little bit because they've actually done some research on it. Uh, and in terms of uh, different age groups, uh, you know, maybe younger females who are pregnant and older, you know, in, in their uh, upper 30s, uh, they're going to have different, obviously, max heart rates. All right, so. They were just basing it on, uh, you know, just heart rate itself instead of maybe percent heart rate or VO2 max. So that may actually uh, change here in, in um, the next few years in terms of the recommendations that doctors will give uh, pregnant women in terms of exercise intensity. And really the best way to go off of RPE, uh, which is rating of perceived exertion. Uh, and a lot of times you go off the Borg scale, which is a scale of 6 to 20. 6 being you're not working at all, and 20 being you're at full max. And actually that's a better recommendation, uh, you know, in terms of moderate in intensity, that 6 to 20, say if they're like a 12 to 15, that's usually probably about the max for the, um, that uh, individual because it's going <clears> to <throat> relate approximately to 60-80% of their VO2 max then. Also, after the first trimester, it's not recommended uh, supine exercise. Uh, I'm also going to add in there um, no prone positions as well uh, later on. And again, that's a whole other issue. But So that was Chapter 17, Exercise for Special Populations.